it's lovely to be here. Um, I'd have never actually been in this place. I feel like more than wanting to read from my book, what I'd love to do is just to ask questions and look at the books and talk about the composting toilet. Um, <laughs> incidentally, last night I went to bed thinking about con composting toilets, uh, the pros and cons, and, um, and here is one for us to all try and think about the pros and cons. Um, I went on this crazy journey to try to understand the GMO. Um, it was not at all something I was intending to do. I don't really think of myself as this kind of writer. Um, I'm still figuring out what kind of a writer I am and still was, even though this was my third book. I, uh, I think of myself as kind of a romantic writer who likes to write, write about kitchen table problems and heartache and heartbreak and um, wide open vistas. And this story and this subject became my kitchen table problem, but I resisted it. It wasn't um, something that I was waving my hand furiously to go out and write a book about GMOs, or for that matter, about science. Um, but I got an illness that no one could understand in 2007, and I spent thousands and thousands of dollars that I really didn't have to try to figure out what was wrong with me, going back and forth to Mass General and, um, and no one could diagnose it until I met an immunologist who suggested that he had this theory about GMO corn and that perhaps if I went off it that um, my immune system would calm down, that he thought that something about the GMO, whether it was the pesticides that are bred into the GMO or the pesticides that come part and parcel with them, or just the changing of the DNA sequences could somehow perturb the immune system to some degree and cause um, something a, a kind of eucinophilia, which is a, an avalanche of white blood cells in my system. I had, I had a lot of, when tested, a lot of eucinophils, which your body mobilizes to fight either allergy or, or disease. Um, and uh, I did go off corn and I got better but uh, about two months later but because I'm naturally just a total pain in the ass I wasn't convinced I wasn't sure I didn't know if it was just coincidence like maybe this thing was just done or was it actually connected to this or was he right and so I started kind of picking the scab and trying to figure out well what First of all, what is a GMO? When he first suggested this to me, it was 2011. My previous book, a memoir, was about to come out. And I had just started working on a novel, which I have now gone back to, but we'll get there maybe some other time later in the evening. Um, and I was excited to be working on the novel, and I, I wasn't thinking I was going to do this at all. But when he it's mentioned a GMO, I remember saying to him, I, what? what? What's that? And so I went home and I started doing a little research. And I don't know, you all look like pretty well-educated people, but if I were to ask you what exactly a GMO is, would you be able to tell me? And if you can, please, please raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, yes, no. That, the, the hand was no. Oh, that was a no. That was a yes. Oh, you can. Okay, great. You don't have to tell me now, but you, that's good that you, that you know. Most, most people, I mean, and I asked lots of really smart seeming people while I was working on this book, I would just sort of randomly ask people, um, do you know what a GMO is? Not to question them or to test them really, but just because I felt like it was such a basic question. It was something that a lot of people seem to be arguing about, in, at least in food in this country. And yet so many of us had no idea what the acronym even stood for. And if we did know what the acronym stood for, what actually happened inside the plant? Like what was put inside or changed or made different? Um, so I kind of opened this dark closet and peered in and slammed the door as fast as I could. And I thought, yeah, this is like not for me. This is for Michael Pollan with his <laughs> assistants and lots of money and his nice Berkeley house. He should do this. But I kind of was intrigued to learn more about our agriculture and our food, mostly as a mother. I had a little child at the time who was two, and he suffered from um, chronic eczema. He had had that since he was a baby, and I wondered why. And um, about a year before uh, this doctor suggested this, I had taken him in an elimination diet. I had taken him off of corn. Just It was one of the things on the diet. 
and his eczema got better. He seemed better. And I didn't have any reason for that. I just, I didn't have any depth to that. I just thought, that's interesting. So, um, when I started to research this subject, I became more interested and I kind of peered into that closet and there were things about corn and about our agriculture and about how our agriculture was affecting the environment and affecting um, climate change that I just didn't know. And so that kind of started me on this journey. That's a very long preamble. Um, I published a piece in 2013 in the Elle magazine that um, uh, created a, a lot of controversy and went viral. And then um, at the same, the same week that it looked as though my credibility was being trashed, um, editors were also calling me to ask me to write a book. It was a very confusing week. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And in fact, there were a lot of editors who really wanted me to have a book that would have a smoking gun and would basically have GMOs are bad because of X and that I had found this thing. And I would say to them, I don't know if you're going to get that book. I don't, I don't know if I want to write that book. And then I finally got on the phone with someone at Putnam and I said to her the same thing. And she said, that's cool. It's going to be a journey. Just go see what you find. And I said, all right. And so that's why I wrote it. And it was an adventure of the life, my lifetime. It, me, I flew out to... Um, Denver and drove across the Great Plains by myself and then I went to Europe and I hung out with beekeepers and traveled with them and learned about honey and about pesticides and um, I used honey and the lives of bees to sort of look at what's happening on a more global scale but on the smaller scale of honey and bees and then um, I went to California and I wrote about a couple of scientists in California and um, really about uh, something that had happened in Oaxaca and, and a Mexican scientist. So that it was a, a real journey and an, an adventure and I talked to all these exciting people and that was fun. So I thought, um, without further ado, unless any of you has a burning question or comment right now. Yes. So in Wheat Belly, a similar story is told. So what's the relation between what you've been doing with corn and what he was writing about, Davis, I think is his name, about wheat? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Oh, Wheat Belly. Yeah. Wheat Belly. Oh, that book. Um, well, let's talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, I'm, I'm interested in wheat, but for a different reason, and I'll become more clear. Uh, so I thought I'd start with, so when I, when I drove across the Great Plains, I um, spent time with, uh, 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 on a farm with a young uh, GMO corn and soybean farmer who also grows GMO uh, who also grows popcorn, which is not a GMO, and we can talk more about that. Um, and then I, uh, and then I decided to turn up at a scientist, a former Monsanto seed scientist, who um, wasn't particularly fond of me at that point. He really, I had been interviewing him for about two years, and he really didn't like me uh, after my piece came out in L. Um, and so along the way, I was thinking about all the crazy phone conversations and interviews I'd had with people up till then. And so this is one of those. So this is called number three. This is a chapter of things that I was thinking about on my way, turning up like a bad penny at this rate. And it's an angry phone call that jangled me up. Are you calling me a whore? Bruce Chassie, a retired university scientist whose pro-GMO lobbying efforts were or are, funded perhaps indirectly by Monsanto, bellowed into the phone. He was speaking to me from his home, nestled high in the mountains of Idaho. No, no, I said, shocked. I, I wouldn't use that word. I was scrambling. The Annie Hall type subtitles moving across the screen went like this. Wow, extreme reaction. I really pissed him off. How can I recover this? Fuck. He went on, outraged. Soon, outrage boiled down to a low simmer of indignation, but he kept talking, and I kept listening. Earlier that spring, after someone had told me that Bruce is a retired plant biologist from the University of Illinois, who had recently become a consultant for Monsanto, I'd emailed him. Bruce also, along the way, got a Fulbright to go to Spain, did research for the National Institutes of Health, and is now a professor emeritus of food safety and nutritional sciences at the University of Illinois. In short, this guy is no slouch. Bruce is helping Monsanto, he told me, essentially clean up their image, because in his words, I think they mishandled the public relations of GM crops terribly. They had an arrogance about how good their product was, 
and a total lack of understanding for the community. He said he, said he did not, just does not do this for pay, but because he believes in biotechnology and what it has to offer the planet. When I finally got Bruce on the phone, it was something after dinner on a cool, damp spring evening. Dan was putting Marsden to bed, and it was dark out. The maple tree outside my office window, where a red-eyed vireo was making a nest with strands of dried grass, dryer lint, bits of wasp nests, and some of our dog hopper's fur from when we brushed him outside, was fluttering its leaves gently in the evening breeze. Our house, one of a handful that comprised a small village center in the quintessential New England river town of New Gloucester, Maine, was a quaint clapper and stone foundation structure with big windows and matching drafts that belonged to a friend who had moved down south. He had offered his house to us after the ceiling had caved in in our Portland rental apartment due to a roof leak, making it uninhabitable. In a flurry, we'd put all our things in storage and landed 30 minutes north of Portland, suddenly surrounded by farms, apple trees, and pumpkin fields. The house was both hilarious in its disrepair and also wonderfully charming in certain corners where the light came in pools, illuminating old wood floors and dark molding. We loved the big yard the three enormous sugar maples, and the snake family that lived in the old barn foundation. In March, we tapped the maples and made our own syrup, and in the spring, we were ecstatic to behold each wave of blooming crocuses, daffodils, tulips, and irises. Bruce is the kind of guy who jumps full throttle into a conversation, as if you've been talking for hours already, leaving little dead space and even less space for questions. His tone isn't exactly friendly either. Underneath the information he pelts you with is a seething quality, which is hard not to notice. First, he wanted to start with some historical background, which he felt I needed, and I heartily agreed. According to Bruce, back when plant genetic engineering looked like it was going to be possible, the industry went to the White House, Bush Sr., and said it might be worthwhile to look at this new technology to see whether it would be, need to be regulated or not. He said that after some careful review, the National Academy of Sciences concluded that genetic engineering was rapid, simple, and precise, and therefore needed little oversight. From a science perspective, he said, we shouldn't have even had to talk about this. The debate wasn't necessary, and the public really didn't need to be involved. So the government said, go for it. Furthermore, he went on, for any GMO on the market, they've probably been working on it for 10 years in the lab and from development to approval is probably 10 to 15 years. So there was ample time for the company to find any problems. He went on to elucidate for me that any testing that's down on the GMO is done by the company themselves, never by the FDA, EPA, or USDA. This was news to me. But he said this was a good thing because it's actually safer when the developer, like Monsanto or Dow or whoever is making the product, produces their data, testing it for environmental and health risks from start to finish. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the feds, he told me, don't have the facility or the scientists to test it. When I asked him if he believes that companies are indeed transparent with their data on products they stand to make money from, or if it's really in their best interest to be transparent, he retorted, it's a crime to withhold data. And furthermore, all those tests are available, and they, the USDA, FDA, EPA, can walk in at any time and ask to see the books. They do that less and less, less than 1% of a time because they don't have the staff. This is so interesting to read right now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> what EPA? Anyway, uh, what did he mean? The USDA or the FDA or the EPA just simply does not have the staff to evaluate the data from the companies developing GMOs, I asked. He told me that for any given product, a company would have to back up two tractor trailer trucks of data and nobody would go through it. But the salient point, he said, the one Americans need to realize is that no company is misrepresenting what they've done. Bruce started to get irritated, I realized in hindsight, when for reasons I wasn't sure about, he took a 180 and veered our conversation toward the anti-GMO activist groups. He especially wanted to talk about the DC-based watchdog group called the Center for Food Safety, whom he dismisses as a special interest group that is wasting our time while they make a lot of money, scaring the people about GMOs. Furthermore, he said, the people opposed to GM are cheats and liars. Well, I asked, can you tell me how else the regular food-buying American people might get the right information about GMOs, if not from these special interest groups? He said, asking the public to make judgments on things they don't know anything about makes no sense. This is highly technical stuff and really hard to understand. But shouldn't people be given information in a manner they can understand, I wanted to know 
Can it be broken down so that the regular parents, like me, can make an informed decision on the subject? Bruce gave a tight, annoyed chuckle. Ultimately, he said, it comes down to this. Trust is the issue. When modified plants and animals are patented, he said, you achieve transparency. Therefore, the public should just trust the companies that have created them. I was getting in dangerous territory here. Because they have patented the product, I asked. He was getting really annoyed by my ignorance. He sighed. People at the companies are the most ethical people I know, he went on. I have less respect for university scientists than I do for industry scientists. It's much more important for a company scientist to be more honest than a university scientist. This was an odd thing to say, given he'd spent much of his own career as a university scientist. But I said okay and let it drop. I didn't want to push it. We talked a little more, but it didn't feel like we were getting any further. So he w and as he was kind of done with me. So I said thank you, and we hung up. I made my way downstairs to the dark kitchen at the back of the old New Gloucester house. Dan was sweeping the floor. The dishes were drying in the rack. What kind of a silly wild goose chase was I on anyway? If it was true that the companies were doing copious amounts of testing of their products, even though the public couldn't see any of those tests, it didn't mean they hadn't happened, right? I was suddenly inspired by Bruce's exasperated confidence, all fired up about those hysterical watchdog groups out there screaming about the boogeyman in order to make money. Dan, I said, this guy I just talked to was so convincing, so assured about GMOs and their safety, I've really started to wonder. That's your story, said Dan, the gray area, the people who are making sense on both sides, the nuance in the middle. I suppose, I said, my mind whirling. But as I stood there watching Dan push a small pile of dirt and dinner detritus into the dustpan with the end of the broom, I found myself going back through the conversation with Bruce, frozen in thought while Dan cleaned. He might say that I'm often frozen in thought while he cleans. <laughs> um, I was wondering what Bruce gained from his position, because everyone stands to gain something, I figure, even this writer, from the stance they take. Emboldened, I decided to call him back and ask him point blank, what exactly is in it for you, working with Monsanto? Do you get a paycheck? Is your background in science ever compromised? How do I trust what you're telling me about the ethical actions of the people at Monsanto? There was a second of silence, and then the onslaught began. I resent the implication that I'd lie and cheat and whore for the job. You can't buy people. We're university scientists. <laughs> Hoping to change the subject, I quickly asked Bruce if he was interested in talking about Simon Hogan's study, which was, was becoming a bellwether of sorts for those I was talking to. I can tell you more about that study later, but that's in the early part of the book. I was learning that it helped me to root out where an interviewee's ideology on GMOs lay. Not that Bruce's ideology was unclear at this point, but I was still hungry for more information from either side that could leave me with a clear understanding I could parlay into a strong thesis statement. GMOs are bad or GMOs are okay. I felt open to inconvenient truths, even if they were just inconvenient to myself. I still wanted to vet out whether I could really pin my own health recovery on the lack of GMOs in my diet. Bruce huffed some more, but did not hang up, though grumbling and clearly put off. He dismissed Simon's study by saying, it was one study, and most of the allergists I know are unconvinced. It was a false positive in an inappropriate study. The people who use that study are not interested in science and not interested in truth. Was there any merit at all to the study, I asked? He sighed. The pea proves that GM crops could be allergenic. Means that that particular crop was allergenic. Bingo. But he went on. It was a lousy experiment. The animal model system had never been used before and wasn't accepted, and it wasn't truly a food allergy. It was actually a respiratory allergy, and the scientific community was not willing to accept that conclusion. He told me about a redo of the study in Europe, where they could not replicate Hogan's results. What did this prove, I wondered. The P is a dead issue. The science is settled. To the media, one paper is news. To the scientific community, one paper is nothing. It was only later that the irony of what he said about being a university scientist occurred to me. And it was really only ironic when viewed from the safety of home, with Hopper there pr to protect me. We always said, to quote poet Elizabeth Bishop, that Hop was safe as houses. Just like when I looked up Bruce on Facebook and saw an image of a bearded guy holding a guitar and sitting in front of an impressive backdrop of, backdrop of shimmering mountains, distance, in this case, was everything. But here I was, six months later, for better or for worse, right in the middle of GMO country, driving myself deeper into the story and the controversy. If off-the-record conversations, 
some unpleasant phone calls, and a handful of scary anecdotes had put me over the edge back home in Maine, why in the world had I stupidly gone on a plane to ask for more? Should I really dance in the eye of this hurricane, I wondered. To keep going rather than turn my car around and just hang, head back to Denver, which seemed like a really nice town right about now, I had to put my head down and suspend all thought. I tuned the iPod to Ryan Adams and let him carry me for the next 80-something miles. So, um, yes? Did you talk with anyone at the Center for Food Safety? Um, I did when I was working on my L piece. I interviewed, um, I think it was Andrew Kimbrell who I interviewed. Somebody. Um, I'm asking because um, Doug Dory and Sherman, who started writing about GMOs, when he was a leader in San Diego, and he is now right. mm -hmm. wrote a piece in response to the infamous New Yorker article about the perspective that you do talk about in the book. Right. Um, and the, the title of the uh, Center for Food Safety response is debunking myths. Um, let's, we're, that's sort of far ahead from where I am right now, but let's get to that, because I, I, that's more at the end of my journey, um, and that's an interesting question, whether or not I think there are any good GMOs. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Did this guy, did he ever answer about whether he ever got a paycheck? Pay so that's a really great question. He, um, so, uh, there's, I feel like there are so many stories I want to tell you, but I, I, I can only tell you some. And the book is so layered and woven, and I'm referencing so many different things throughout the book, so bear with me. I'll try to, in a sort of okay. circular way, get to things. But that's a great question. So just to give you a little bit of background. So back when I told you that piece came out in Elle magazine in 2013, when it came out... Um, and I was, you know, being pilloried. I actually didn't even know I was being attacked at first. My husband was, I, that's the thing, is I'm never on the internet. I'm never on social media. I'm, I'm the last person to find out that I'm in trouble um, with anything. And my husband was in Boston doing a photo shoot, and it was boiling hot, you know, here in Maine. And uh, it was my birthday week. And it was just like a through the looking glass, glass kind of moment. My agent was getting harassed. With, with journalists who were calling her and trying to get to me and she was saying no um, and that I had no comment and I was also, there were these pieces happening but so just to back up to that back, it, w later when in 2000 and um, so the, uh, 15 <coughs> right before, we did a six month long protracted uh, legal and fact checking for this book which is almost unheard of I had two fact checkers and pretty much the entire legal counsel at Putnam. Um, I had the head lawyer at Putnam and, uh, and various uh, associates working, <laughs> working on this book because it was such a problem, right? Um, and uh, so in the midst of all that, I got on the phone with a reporter named Eric Lipton at the New York Times. Have any of you read him? He's like one of the only people writing really terrific hard pieces about what's going on with industry and who's making money and food in this country. So I got on the phone with him, somehow to do with the fact checking. But I think because he was in the book, I had mentioned him. And, um, and we were on the phone, and he said, oh, you're that woman. <laughs> and I said, which woman's that? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you're in those emails. And I said, what emails? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, the US Right to Know campaign sued and got a bunch of mo emails between Monsanto and some scientists. and." of journalists for hire for Monsanto and you're actually in those and those guys were hired by Monsanto to attack you after that piece came out mm -hmm. so I didn't I did that was like a, a, a sort of clouds parting moment for me because I had I knew it was the attacks were in the attacks at my credibility and trying to make me seem ridiculous um, and not only that they went after me for my gender that was the thing that that was the that was the big mistake that's what sold my book actually yeah. That was the huge mistake they made, and I'll circle back to that in a second, but um, uh, it, that, the clouds kind of parted for me because I had really been 
afraid, you know, at times driving across Nebraska and meeting with some of these people. In fact, there's a whole part in the book where I'm meeting with this Monsanto seed scientist and he gets mildly threatening to me and it's night and it's windy and I'm really far from home and I suddenly thought I'm not going to spend the night in this town anymore and I drove to Omaha and I was exhausted I've been driving since Denver and I'd been on a tractor all day you know sort of harvesting soybeans and corn even though I was just sitting there um, but uh, and so I, I, I you know it was just a, 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 an amazing moment because I thought I'd been afraid all this time and this was actually all set up by these guys. So who knows? I would love to, to figure out, you know, to, to subpoena somehow more emails and find out other things that may have happened. But, um, but it, that was a really interesting. And as far as this guy, Bruce Chassie, goes, um, Eric Lipton, to come back to him, wrote a terrific piece right before my piece came out and you, my book came out. And you can um, Google that. And it's about, and it's about Bruce Chassie um, and another guy who attacked me named Kevin Folta. And I had been interviewing Bruce Chassie for years, actually. This is just, he's just in the book you know, a little bit. But, um, and it's about how actually they were getting paid by Monsanto. I, I, indirectly or directly, it was, he traces the money and he looks at the emails and he looks at the way that they were getting special perks and they were being sent on trips to go sort of proselytize the GMOs and they were getting uh, lavish hotel rooms and first class plane tickets or um, going on company jets, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and you can see his, his badgering tone in those emails, like I'm not making it up, where he's asking the Monsanto people and badgering them to get paid or um, things like that. So, uh, so th that, that was interesting. But um, is there some thread that I needed to come back to as well? <laughs> Or did, did I miss one, one other thing? No, 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 we're there. Okay. Who, Bruce? Oh, he told me that he wasn't paid at all. So this book has, a, like, as, as, as you were mentioning, the book has footnotes. And the footnotes, um, just this is kind of, I don't know how much you want me to read and yak at you, and you probably have a lot of questions and things you want to say too, but, but the, the book, this is kind of like a writer thing. Um, it has a ton of footnotes in it, and uh, all through it. And the reason, have any of you read um, David Foster Wallace or uh, Juno Diaz, mm -hmm. who, whom I especially love? So, oh, he Juno Diaz, right? right? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, the, you know, The Brief Wondrous Life right. of Oscar yeah. Wilde? Yeah. I love that book. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of odd to be writing a book about science and GMOs, but so at the end of the day, I really am a writer and a storyteller and I'm not and I was trying to learn the science on the fly and I sat down to write this book and a couple of things were going on I'll tell you the second one second but the first one was I thought oh my god this is gonna be so fucking boring this is the worst why did I ever do this this is such a bad idea and I was like crying on my I thought this is so boring who cares who cares and um, and how am I gonna explain this science because Bruce wasn't the only Monsanto guy who had said to me, the American people don't need to know. They don't need to have this explained to them, and you as a mother don't have any right to know. You just need to trust us. There was another Monsanto guy who was in the book who said essentially the same thing. Why do you need to know? And I said, because, because I, I feel like I want to write this down, and I want to make it so that people understand why this is it's such a good thing. Tell me, and I'll explain it. You know, I, that's what I can do. So... Um, I was writing, the book was really so that I could, um, I, m the person I envisaged when I was writing this book was a mother at the beach and her kids are running in and out of the water, but they're not so young they're going to drown. They're, they're okay. And you, she can, they come in and she puts sunblock on them and gives them some crackers or whatever and she's sitting in her chair, but she can go back to it and find her place just like she could with a Leanne Moriarty novel or something. That was the book. That was the book I wanted to write, and that was the person I felt like I needed to explain the GMO to. So the footnotes. I thought this is going to be terribly boring. And then, for some reason, Juno Diaz came out of the, you know, out of the clouds to me, and he was there, sort of like the mother in that Woody Allen movie, uh, speaking to me. And he said, "Give them footnotes." So the footnotes become these little. <laughs> These little, they're in my voice, they're these little riffs and comments and sometimes extra stories about people or about what they're wearing or about what I was eating or about what I'm thinking about 
or contradicting what somebody says, or more science or more politics. And it was just my way, it was sort of my writerly device to make this less boring for me, that I could write this narrative, which actually ended up not being at all boring to write. But it was the footnotes that got me into that. So um, uh, the second, the, well, I'll tell you that story later. So I'm going to read you my brother, who's here tonight. Um, he'll give me a, 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 a probably a brief on how well or not well I did tonight on the way home. <laughs> Suge offered to me a uh, couple of suggestions of what to read tonight. And I've never read this part out loud, so except for to my husband. So I thought maybe I would read this. Um, now I think it needs a little bit of setup. Um, and this is just a couple of pages. Are you still ready for more reading, or is it too much? Should I shut up? You want me to shut up? Ever? Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> if you still want more, I have a third section, but I don't know if you do. So this is kind of, this isn't that long, but I'll I'll um, I, I want to set this up a little bit. Um, if you do want to go, you, now's a good time. You're welcome. To <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't be offended. I'd completely understand. Remember, I told you I put my head down and thought this is going to be so fucking boring. I can't write this book. Where's my novel right about now? Um, I was all, yeah. So anyway, um, the, I, so I flew out to Berkeley, California. And the reason I went was to meet two scientists, one of whose name was Ignacio Chapella. And he's a Mexican scientist who had studied corn in Oaxaca, in the Oaxacan highlands, uh, grown by indigenous farmers that had been contaminated somehow by U.S. grown GMO corn. Mm -hmm. The question was how, how, right? An area that seems pretty remote. Yeah. He proved this and then a total shitstorm rained down on him. Okay? He wrote a paper about it. So. I flew out to California to interview him, not so much about the study itself and the paper he wrote, which I read about, but like what happened. And it turned out he had never actually told this whole story to anybody. So, um, and he was so ethical, you know, I thought that I was going to have to ply him with coffee and a nice lunch and all these things. And then he told me that he didn't want me paying for anything and he actually paid for his own lunch and his own everything. Um, and uh, he wouldn't be bought by me on, on any level, which was great. It made me respect him more. Um, so I flew out to California, and I sat down with him, and we are in Berkeley, staying at this terrific place called the Berkeley City Club. Has anyone ever stayed there before? No, actually, my dad paid for my hotel room. Oh, look, I, t I do have some of these. Look, Brooke, I have these for you if you want to put them on your books. These are from my last thing. Somebody gave them to me. Um, um, so if you, you, if you want, you could have one of those main literary award stickers on your book if you buy them. Um, so the Berkeley City Club um, is this beautiful old um, uh, stone structure that was built by the architect Julia Morgan, one of the first female architects. Amazing pool. You just have to go to sl Well, She also designed the Neptune pool in the Hearst Castle. She, she's amazing, and what's amazing is that her architecture, I could go on and on about architecture, but her, her architecture is so masculine and strong, but at the same time has such a lovely, beautiful feminine touch. I mean, she's a wonder. That pool is one of the nicest pools to swim in. Even if you're not really a very good swimmer, swimmer and you're afraid of drowning like I am, you'll still want to swim in that pool. Um, anyway, it has a big p bowl of apples when you walk in, it's lovely. So I was there, and I had invited him to lunch, and here he is. And so he's telling me about when the, uh, the chaos really started um, with his paper, okay? Back in Berkeley, and now on our second cup of coffee, Ignacio said that even when he and David Quist, that was his graduate student who was working with him, we're finishing up the details of their paper. He knew that the wandering theory, okay, so there was this theory in his paper that DNA would wander, uh, all right? It wouldn't stay in the spot you put it in. Does that make sense, where you inject it? We can get more into that later, but just that's the basics. He, um, he knew that the wandering theory would be groundbreaking, and the contamination piece would become a lightning rod. I know it's going to be a big scandal, because I know the field. 
I know the forces, and I know that everybody's scared and worried about contamination. So I submit the paper. When I got the first peer reviews, they were very positive. I said, now I'm going to start calling people on the phone. So I made a list of people I thought would be involved in the response to this news, and I started calling them personally. And I say, I want you to know that we're very likely going to be publishing this paper in Nature that you're going to be affected by. He said that on that list of people were heads of NGOs and government officials, though he couldn't remember off the top of his head who they all were. I asked Ignacio point blank, why in the world would you send up smoke signals like that? After all, we were starting to get to know each other a bit better by now, and my courage to challenge him was growing. Perhaps it was the caffeine, along with my desire to make sure I got the record straight. He told me that at the time, what was going through his head was that if his study hit the airwaves quickly and without any advance warning given to the people who might be able to speak to it or to contextualize it, it was all going to be in the hands of reporters who have no idea what to do with it and no idea what it means, and it's going to be a really bad scuttling of the subject. When I pressed Ignacio a bit further, he admitted that he was playing defense. So my thinking was, everybody will run to them, the biotech companies, and between reporters badly reporting the situation and Monsanto, they're biotech, going to manage the whole thing to their advantage, and nobody will have any chance of exercising their intelligent analysis. That's why I was making the calls. In an even bolder move, Ignacio accepted an offer to go down to Mexico to give a co closed doors, only with experts seminar on his data before it was printed. This is now April 2001. He told me, so they fly me in, and it's a meeting where the ministers and scientists for the ministers and everybody's there. But I speak to them on the condition of confidentiality because my policy, by policy, nature will not publish something that has been touched by media. Uh, interesting idea to go do that, but anyway. Since I'm not the one going through it, I can see hearing this story how this might be poised to explode all over Ignacio. But remember, Ignacio has a reputation for being something of a pain in the ass. I said to him, it seems obvious to me at this point that this is going to hell in a handbasket. Why wasn't it to you? In his defense, he said that scientists are always giving seminars on work that they're researching or that it is on, that is on its way to being published. I was able to confirm this from various sources. Dr. Ezekiel Escura also told me, scientists are always excited and want to let people know they've had important findings. However, with the political din surrounding Ignacio's work, Escura said, Chapella tried to do it under the radar, but it got botched. Over the next few months, things started to devolve with nature, despite the fact that nature can accept a paper and publish it within a week, which Ignacio had originally hoped they were on track to accomplish. Some of the later peer reviewers of the paper had begun to cast some serious doubts on his study. So Nature asked Ignacio and Quist to recheck some of their results. They started working frantically during the night's Pacific Standard Time to keep up with the London-based publication. Over the next few months, Ignacio and Quist endured five rounds of back and forth with Nature, which is unheard of. Still, no publication. And then the story gets weird. It goes like this. Ignacio goes back to Mexico for more meetings in September, and he gives another closed-door seminar on what his research has found. After the seminar, as he's leaving, there's this big guy waiting there, and he says, well, I'm here in representation of Mr. So-and-so, who is the chair of the Committee on Biosafety for Mexico, and my boss, he would like to talk to you. I said, that's why I'm here, you know, I'm going to talk to him. So what follows next is like a gangster story. According to Ignacio, he and the big guy got into a green and yellow Mexico City taxi, a VW Beetle. The big guy mutters an address to the driver, which Ignacio couldn't quite hear. As they started to drive, Ignacio says that he asked where they were going, and the answer was, we're going to the office. <laughs> to which he asked, where's that? <laughs> and the response was, oh, it's not far. Then he said, I'm taken into this really shady part of Mexico City where bodies are dumped and that kind of thing. He says he starts to get really nervous when they arrived at what appeared to be a virtually empty building. Maybe one or two floors were occupied with some kind of governmental offices, and they had a guard at the entrance. But it was completely empty by that time because it was after five. And we walk in and go up to the 13th floor. At that point, of course, it's got to be the 13th floor, right? <laughs> at that point, he said, he was starting to internally and silently panic. Then he told me, the elevator opens and it's this dark floor of an empty building, and there's a little light at the end of this dark hallway coming out of a room, and it's the boss with a big mustachio, it's kind of funny, in an office that is made of cardboard boxes, 
a door taken off the hinges on top of the cardboard boxes. That's his table. He has a cell phone, he has a laptop, there's a coffee maker, and a maid making coffee. <laughs> the man, it turns out, whom Ignacio describes as being like a charro, the guy with the big hat, the big silken bow tie, and a horse who sings and plays guitar and shoots in the air, was a high-ranking government official, the executive secretary of the Commission for Biosafety and Genetically Modified Organisms of Mex Mexico, by the name of Fernando Ortiz Monasterio. Escora told me that Monasterio was very flamboyant, very good looking in his youth, and from a family of intellectual aristocracy in Mexico. He had bushy eyebrows and wore bow ties that mariachi or char charros wear. According to Ignacio, Monasterio ordered that the maid leave, and he's left with the bodyguard and this guy, Monasterio, whom Ignacio describes as just the nastiest, nastiest person you can imagine. Next, Monasterio spent, he said, about one hour berating me, just telling me, you know, with really bad language, what a big hole I've dug for myself, and what a big problem I've created, and how I'm about to ruin the reputation of Mexico, and stop a whole technology that is going to save the world, blah, blah, blah. Then, says Ignacio, Monasterio offers him a solution to the problem. He tells Ignacio he's a great scientist, that nobody denies the fantastic qualities of your research, and I've arranged for five of the best scientists in your field to get together and to try to deal with your fucking mess. So Ignacio asks who the other four scientists are going to be, and Monasterio reportedly tells Ignacio that they would come from Monsanto and DuPont. So you and four scientists from the industry will take you to this fantastic place in Baja, California. You will not be disturbed by anybody, and you will write the paper. You will get a publication in Nature, but what you're going to say is that what you found is a piece of DNA that exists naturally. Ignacio said that this was all just too unbelievable to comprehend. Suddenly he's being guaranteed a Nature publication, which is pretty darn elusive right about now, but not of the study he originally submitted. Instead, he's being asked to rewrite his own study with help from some industry hacks. He says that he told Monasterio that I'm very happy to work with anybody, including industry, but I'm not about to let them tell me what I'm going to print. And also, I have a job, you know. I have to go back to Berkeley, and I have class on Monday, and I'm not doing this. So he got really mad, and he told the bodyguard, show him the offices. <laughs> At which point, Ignacio says he started to feel faint. He said, the bodyguard started walking me through these completely desolate, messed up spaces. The carpets were all curled up like there had been floods inside the building. You could see this big dumpster in back of the building, and I was just thinking, gosh, and I'm I going to be thrown out the window here? Is that what's going to happen next? It was just so unbelievable, you know. Ignacio paused and took a sip of coffee. And then what happened, I asked. I was glued to my seat at this point, wondering what horrible thing was going to happen next. Tony Soprano around the next corner, a Mexican drug lord guns what? Ignacio smiled for effect. Nothing happened, he said. He just walked me through these empty spaces and then forced me to go down to the basement. I said, no, thank you. I'll just take a cab. And then he said, no, no, no. The boss insists that he has to give you a ride. <clears throat> And so we went down to the basement where he had waiting for them his big black suburban. And then he started talking about my daughter and insisting that he wanted to drop me off where my sister lives, basically just talking about my family and what he knew about, you know, my vulnerable points in my life or something. Mm. And that was it. That was it? Really? Could Ignacio just have a majorly fictive imagination that made, him, made it seem scarier than it really was? I decided to call up Ezequiel Escura to ask him if this story seemed far-fetched. Could Ignacio Chapella truly have been threatened by Monasterio? I asked. Yes, said Escura. It makes sense that he was bullied or threatened by him. As a caveat, Escura said, between you and me, sometimes Chapella sees conspiracy where I might not see it. He sometimes seems to be overly concerned about the evilness of people. But that does not mean he was not bullied. Even so, when I got home from California, I tried to find Monasterio. First, I found a famous plastic surgeon by the same name from the same family who happened to be dead. Then I found an architect who was Monasterio's son, also with the same name. Undaunted, I started writing and calling the son, trying to find El Papa. No one responded to me, though the son's secretary and I became friendly, and I was getting to practice more Spanish than I had since I lived in Salamanca for a summer when I was 14. Finally, over two years later, just as this book was going to press, I was able to smoke the real Monasterio out. Should, do you want to hear about him? Yeah. All right, two more pages here. Nate, you don't need to buy the book now. I told, <laughs> I told you the whole thing. Um, on a brilliantly sunny and snowy Saturday morning at home in Maine, the man himself agreed to talk to me by his phone. 
for the small birds in the mountains outside of Mexico City. Not sure if he knew who I was, I started in. He cut me off and told me he knew exactly who I was. That he'd read all my emails. FYI, he said, so thank you. He told me that he had my most recent and long list of questions right in front of him. He said he was happy to go through them point by point. However, he said, before we began, he wanted to make sure I understood what to him were two important considerations. I, this might seem like a theme. There was a lot, um, my friend Susan Conley read a very early draft. She said, Caitlin, there are so many men in this book. You've got to find some women. They're all mansplaining. They're all telling you what you need to understand. Find some women. In comes Shelley Pinkery, like my token woman, yeah, and a couple other people. Um, I said, sure, I'm happy to do this, however works best for you. He said, thank you, and then took charge. First, he told me he wanted me to separate in my writing him as a government representative 15 years ago and me as a name you publish in your book as Fernando. I was a public servant, he told me, who had a mandate. I agreed. Okay. He, okay, he said. Then he said, he wanted me to understand the Mexican climate into which Ignacio unleashed his conclusions about GMO proliferation. Tell me, I said. I will, he said. And honestly, he sounded quite reasonable and not at all scary. So I sat back with my pen scratching my notebook as he spoke, confident with that with him in charge of the narrative I was about to hear, very little would be left unaddressed. Chapella's work is remarkable and it's commendable, he told me. It is unequivocal that he found something widely known and widely expected. I have respected what he did and also what he went through. My position has always been in his favor. You must understand that at that time in Mexico, we were importing several million tons of genetically modified corn from the U.S. every year. There was a vast distribution of the corn into the marketplace and everywhere in the country of Mexico. Can you imagine that that corn sold for cattle wasn't going to be planted? There is a contradiction in the government between saying we shouldn't plant this stuff and the harsh reality that we are invaded. I have said for 15 years that Mexico should not plant GMO corn. Mexico is the center of diversity for corn. The big companies, of course, want this market, but no country of origin should plant GMOs, just like the U.S. and Canada should not plant GMO canola and Peru should not plant GMO potatoes. Countries of origin of any plant should not allow GMOs of that species. Points taken, I told him. Now that I've told you those two things, we can move on to your questions, he said. He told me he had had Ignacio brought to him for a meeting. And yes, he said, the offices were under construction. We had no furniture and no salary, no rooms. It was tough luck, bad conditions of work for such an important job. Did you really have your desk on top of cardboard boxes, I asked, suddenly feeling a surprising combination of protective toward him and also just embarrassed that I was asking what seemed to me to be such a first world question. Yes, he said, it was hard. But he said, what our offices looked like is irrelevant. What was the tone of your meeting, I asked. Direct, he said. I had to explain the position of the Mexican government, and this is not the same tone with which I am talking to you, Caitlin. We were meeting as friends. The informa we were not meeting as friends. The information he had was a cherry bomb for biosafety. Did you threaten him, I asked. I have heard this before, he said, the fact that Ignacio felt threatened. But he said he could assure me that I was professional but not friendly. It's completely wrong to say I threatened him. However, he went on. He feels that these details of how the meeting did or didn't go are, are irrelevant to the bigger point. Don't lose yourself in the details, he instructed, when what is important was the meeting between a public servant, servant and a scientist who brought to life an important reality. Did you swear at him, I asked. No, he said he did not swear. Did you feel that Ignacio's discovery would hurt biotechnology and NAFTA, I asked. Yes, he said. His information would change public policy in the country and probably the world. It was very important. Did you ever intimate that he should redo the study with industry scientists in Baja, I asked. I don't remember Baja, California, he said. But I did say that he should do this again with university <coughs> scientists, government scientists, and yes, since Monsanto has better <coughs> labs and techniques, their conclusion would be important too. So they would give us more evidence of what we were sure was happening to corn in Mexico, he said. Did you ever suggest that he change his evidence? No, absolutely no. This is out of this world. It was in the interest of biosafety to say, look, we're in danger. We all knew he was right. Is the implication that I didn't want him to tell the truth? Yes, that's the implication, I said. Not true, he said. To retread a bit, I asked, did you or a bodyguard ever imply, to physically, ever imply physical threat to Ignacio? 
a bodyguard, he snorted. We were without offices. A bodyguard is completely out of the context. But I understand you come from an aristocratic family. Did you have a chauffeur or some family staff who might have been helping you that day? I had some friends who helped me. <laughs> That's maybe who brought me here and back, but no family staff was involved. Then what happened, I asked. Well, Ignacio left. Does it bother you that Ignacio tells a story that's different from yours? No, it doesn't bother me, he said. It's irrelevant, and it minimizes the point that there are higher levels of debate, debate which are urgently needed on GMOs. Again, he said, what is relevant is that he changed public policy on GMOs. That is more important than the driver or no driver and what part of the town we met in. Not to be a pain in the ass, but can we address once more that he felt unsafe? <laughs> he said, look, the fear is real. Revolutionary scientists are going to change the world. And if you go to war to change the world, you better not be afraid. Chapella's work threatened international perception of science, and he was not supported by his government or his university, and he fought for his study like Quixote and the windmills. Mm -hmm. Chapella's contribution to understanding the problem of GMOs in the world is a turning point. If he likes me or not, that's another thing. What he did was courageous and stood against the wind. He was right. It's in everything. It's everywhere. I honor and I value and I respect his position. His work made a difference, period, in the world. Let's stop there. That's about <laughs> um, Are we going to go back to the end about the papayas? Okay. Yeah. I hope we will get there. We can get there, yes. Um, I found it interesting that Chapel didn't seem to want to agree that the illness Right. And then I, I bring it up because to me, Chapala has the credibility and mm -hmm. it's important to be things. So to resolve that feeling disconnect, mm -hmm. I would wonder why you didn't have that same conversation with other people like Stephanie Stennett, who you call controversial, and Vandana Shiva who uh, has mm -hmm. a lot to say about the kind of uh, health effects that she has Um. Let's see. I'm not sure how to answer that exactly. Cause you're, I feel like you're asking a bunch of questions at once. But I, what I can answer, and I'm not sure I, I know all the answers actually. But um, the reason I did it the way I did with Chapella is because. Uh, you actually bring up a really interesting point, and I'm glad you found him so credible. Um, that is great for me to hear. When I sat down to write this section, I had already, Juno Diaz had already appeared in the clouds like Woody Allen's mother, and um, I was well on my way, but I was writing this last section, and uh, I, uh, I sat down to write this section, and I thought, this guy is full of shit. This, yeah, this story is bullshit. And I panicked, right? And I did the most insane fact-checking I've ever done on anything or anyone in my life. And I cross-examined him and called everyone I could find in Mexico or California or at Berkeley. And I presented every voice I possibly could. And the reason I did that is because I felt that his story, more than anything, was... Um, it was like sort of the worst nightmare of what could happen if you if you wrote a paper like this, and I needed to know that what he was saying was true. I had to hold myself to the same level of scrutiny. And so the whole way through, whether or not I'm asking anybody, or, or him or anybody else, um, I, was, I was always wondering if what this doctor had said was wrong with me was possible. And so I, that was sort of, that's a theme throughout the book of testing that theory and being open myself to, as I read in an earlier part, inconvenient truths that might even be inconvenient to my own narrative. Um, and I liked that about Chapella, and that's why I wrote about it. I liked that he wasn't sure he bought it about me. I thought that was really interesting about him. And I also liked that story I tell in the book about him in a cornfield and suddenly feeling sick, because it showed that he's either totally highly neurotic, or maybe there was something to this, to this, to, to, to what I was saying, but I wanted the reader 
to put that together. Um, so, yeah. This one other story I was just going to tell you about writing this book that week that I sat down and was waiting for Chino Diaz was um, I also had decided after I got the research done, I thought, well, why not write a book about science and agriculture that involves all this travel and get pregnant and have my second child at the same time? <laughs> right? Like, what? why not try to do all this at once? That just seems normal. Um, and of course, I was feeling, at my first child for nine months, I puked. And I was really nervous that that was going to happen the second time. So I got the Great Plains and uh, Europe done. And I was about to go to California when I got pregnant. And unfortunately, these things are just way too easy in my family. So I thought this was going to take a while. It did not. Um, and so I, got on, I, w w I sat down on April 1st thinking I'm going to start writing my book that week. And around the same time, I was having the crisis about this is going to be the most boring fucking book I've ever written in my life. Um, I started to feel extremely nauseous, like extremely nauseous. And I would see notes over here on a table, and I thought it would take me hours to get up and go get them and bring them back, or I'd just write around them. I'd write in big caps, like, part about blah, blah, blah. I know it's in the red notebook because I couldn't get up. Well, anyway, fast forward this book. I wrote it in chunks. The first section is about the Great Plains. The second section is about Europe, and the third section is about California and corn. And um, my child was due in November, and the book was due in August. But of course, the book was not handed in in August. I had handed in the first section and the last section, and I was rewriting the B section. And I had um, it was a Wednesday, and um, I had a few like six pages of notes that I was still going to work in. I was going to hand it in on Friday. And I was walking around Mackworth Island near, it was, my, my son was two and a half weeks away from his due date. And we didn't have a crib or a car seat. I mean, we were going to hand the book in, right? This is what you do. You hand your book in, and then you have your child. This is just <laughs> the reasonable way to do things. You get that done. So I just had a little bit more. Then I was going to write the epilogue, and then I would have this child. It all just work out fine. I'm walking around Mackworth Island, and my water broke. And I thought, you Bitch, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> this is, I'm so close. So I go to the hospital, drenched, and I walk in and I'm carrying my computer. <laughs> and they looked at me and they're like, you know, your doctor called and they said, we were going to check you out and see, but we can look just, we, you, you're sure you didn't pee? And I said, no, it just, I keep, you know, it's like I had to put a coat down in the car. So I got in there and they checked me out and they do all the requisite tests. Dan is, my husband worked in Port Portsmouth and we were, live in Freeport and he's speeding, I think he actually got a speeding ticket that day. He's speeding back. I have no bag packed either. I never bothered with any of these details. The details that most people deal with when they're going to have a child. Um, and he's speeding back and I've got my computer in there and they've checked me out and the woman says, so you know, we've confirmed this, we've hooked you up and everything and I'm going to go out and tell your doctor where you are. And I said, great, so are we all set? And she said, what do you mean? I said, we all we all set for right now? <laughs> she said, I think so. And I said, great, so here's what you're going to do. I don't want you to come back for two hours. I don't want anyone in here. I want the door shut and no one is to come in. And she, looked at me, she said, two hours? And I said, two hours. She said, you realize you're in labor. I realize I'm in labor. <laughs> but I want two hours. I'm going to hand a book in right now. So she went out, and Dan shows up. He, they've told him already. And apparently, they've called the doctor and said, we have a crazy woman <laughs> in here. And he said, don't worry. It gets too bad. I'm sure you'll hear from her. He walked in. He said, they said you're telling them they can't, they can't come in. He's trying to take the computer. Said, do not touch the computer. <laughs> do, you want, do not touch the computer. <laughs> I did. I got the book in. A few hours later, I had the baby. <laughs> well, that, this is my third child. What Dan said at our, my book party, now that we've had two children and now our third. Um, so. Anyway, I'm done talking. I'd love to hear from you. Any more questions um, about anything? Yeah. Oh yeah, all my friends say uh, they, they'll never buy a GMO. 
And then she laughed and said, but, you know, you buy a tomato, it's a GMO. And but what she was saying was that any kind of sort of Mendelian organization mm -hmm. is the same as a GMO. Right. That was never explained. And I just wondered if you could say something about that, uh, about the difference between, you know, that kind of uh, hybrid, hybrid, hybridization well, and, and what a GMO is and why she was wrong to say that. Yeah, so this is a question, this is a perfect place to answer this question. Um, I get asked this question a lot, and, um, and this is a really, I go through pains in the beginning of this. I even drew little pictures, and so did my, was he six? Six-year-old or seven-year-old who drew some of the pictures in the book, too, to help explain some of these things. But um, I go to pains to try to break this down for people. But in essence, hybridization is what farmers do, right? If you take an apple tree and you graft, um, if you have a Macintosh, you, you probably all know this. I'm probably telling you something. Should I continue? Yes. Okay. Um, but if you have a Macintosh apple tree and you take a, gra a piece of a Granny Smith, a, a branch from a Granny Smith, and you graft it and you tie it on with some twine, uh, everything above the graft will be Granny Smith apples, right? Um, farmers have made these kind of changes from, for you know, 10,000 years, right? Um, <coughs> perhaps longer. Uh, in, in Oaxaca, the corn that uh, was contaminated, um, you know, each farmer had uh, hybridized and coaxed and uh, babied their corn through in their families. And for that little piece of earth, whether there was a stream running through it or none, whether it was windy or whatever was going on there, um, farmers have been the shepherds um, and the stewards of our land, really. And to, to create something in a lab where you're introducing entirely new DNA, um, the best example is the frost-proof strawberry, which takes um, flounder DNA um, and injects it into the strawberry plant, right, so that strawberries um, can, won't freeze. Um, flounder, as you know, is a bottom fish that doesn't freeze. Um, these are two things that would never mate in nature. This isn't like the making of a pluot, which is... Uh, an apricot and a plum, is that right? Um, so, and in the case of most GMOs, the GMO crops that I'm the most concerned about, and this may get to your point, the, the GMO points that the crops that I'm the most concerned about are the crops that we are blanketing the planet with, which are essentially corn, canola, soy, and cotton. These are highly sprayed crops, and um, they can have all kinds of different what are called cryproteins inserted into them which are insecticides. They have all kinds of different insecticidal actions. So we are not only putting DNA that makes something say um, withstand glyphosate but we're also putting DNA that makes something have its own insecticidal action. Uh, that is entirely different than what a farmer or a gardener may do when trying to cross. I mean I have something growing in my garden right now. Perhaps I'm a, a, a hybridizer um, or a GMO maker, if this woman is correct, but I have a, some sort of weird delicata cucumber thing um, <laughs> gr gr from my compost pile. And we, just, we had two of them that we killed, and we kept one because it was so fascinating. My son and I wanted to see what was going to happen. Um, and it is kind of fi fun to find out what's going to happen, but that's what farmers have been doing forever. Um, but that's entirely different than doing this in a lab. And we could get into more detail about what's actually in those GMO crops and what they come with, and that's really the important stuff than these kind of fun stories that I've been telling is the environmental um, aspect of this. These crops are highly, highly sprayed, um, and the, the GMO came with a whole bunch of false promises. Um, none of them have turned out to be true about whether or not they would provide more food, actually hunger. We have over a billion um, food insecure people on the planet. The, the number has, on the same pendulum that GMOs have, have increased, uh, so has hunger. Um, we, the, the, the promise that we were going to spray less pesticide, um, uh, we, may, we, we may, in a sense, with two caveats, spray less pesticides insecticide, but on the other hand, we spray far more, depending on whom you talk to, 21 to 46 percent more herbicide. But the other caveat is, is that we are also soaking all these GMO seeds in something called neonicotinoids, which is a seed treatment. Um, and this is uh, a highly toxic um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, compound that affects the bees 
and um, many other insects and, and aquatic and birds. Um, so, and mammals. Yeah. <laughs> so many questions. Okay, let's start here. Neurotoxins. That's the word I was searching for. Neonics or neurotoxins. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. is there such a thing as a good GMO? Okay. So, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that we ha are going to have to take this case by case. Okay. I think that I'm not interested. I'm not. I'm a writer. I'm not an activist. I'm not on one side or the other. And I really succeeded in pissing off everybody with this book because because I wrote it down the middle of the road. Um, and I talked to people on both sides. And when people were too much one way or the other, and they didn't fit with you know the sort of the larger story I was trying to tell, which was an environmental story. Really, the book ends up being an environmental book. It, 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 they, they didn't necessarily work for the book. So, um, and I interviewed, I mean, the book took me five and a half years, and I interviewed tons of people. Um, but I, I don't know. Like, I think, we have, I think we have some really tough questions that we're going to have to ask ourselves. Um, and I don't want to debate this with you, but I think you should go home asking yourselves, like, for instance, the GMO mosquito, OK? Zika. Maybe Zika is less at the forefront right now, but there's going to be a GMO tick as well, right? Um, or maybe it's the mouse, mouse or something. The mouse, and that's going to affect the tick. But um, uh, we have to ask ourselves, so in the case of the mosquito, I think it was in uh, South Carolina where there was this panic about Zika, and there was tons of spraying. Am I ringing a bell? Is it my... Well, Miami, but the place where all the bees died, I think, was South Carolina. So, you know, bees are, bees are a sexier insect. We hear when bees die. What we don't hear about is all of those other insects that frogs eat and birds eat and that are completely necessary to our ecosystem that get killed when we spray. So we may have to make a choice. Are we going to unleash a, a mosquito that who knows what it's going to become, but it may somehow disarm the virus. There are two GMO mosquitoes out there right now, and the one that seems the most intriguing to me is the one that carries the capability to disarm the virus. Or are we going to spray the bejesus out of the planet? Uh, I'm going to tack in for favor of the, maybe, I guess, in the one that I don't know all the answers. With this caveat that once you unleash these things into the environment, you don't know what's going to happen. But, I, but the, the, the pesticides I know are bad. So the book, the book really started with the idea of the GMO, and the GMO itself became less and less interesting to me. What became interesting to me, and the book really becomes a book about pesticides and toxins. Um, there's a, a lot in the book about Rachel Carson and her legacy, and how um, what's crazy rereading. I reread Silent Spring a few times while I was working on the book, and uh, it was published in 1962. And other than DDT, we're still using all those same pesticides. In fact, now we're making crops that are resistant to those same pesticides, like 2,4-D, which mix, when mixed with 2,4-5-T makes Agent Orange. We are making 2,4-D resistant crops and using it as an herbicide because glyphosate Roundup is no longer working and we have super weeds. Have I lost you yet? No. Huh? No. Okay. Yeah. So you made a trip to Europe and the Europeans yeah. have traditionally been very suspicious of the uh, disease. Right. GMOs and other American methods to kind of enhance the food, food stuff. So, what, have they been successful in keeping them out, or, or is it going to... Well, that's work? the whole mystery of that section. I don't think you're there yet. I can see your bookmark. <laughs> You'll get there. <laughs> that, but in the middle of the book, I do look at this exact question, because I, as an American, and other Americans I knew always were saying to me, the grass is so much greener over there, they do it so much better. So I thought, well, if they do it better, let me go there and find out. So I used honey and beekeeping to, and I also spent some time in the parliament, but I used those as sort of my uh, container to, to look at also the policy and, and how the, uh, I mean, you know, trade alliances, things like this, um, it, it's hard to keep anywhere pure in the world. So. But I'd be interested to hear what you have to say after you read that section. It, it, it would, would take me forever to answer it, wait, yeah, honestly. I was following it a lot earlier, but uh, in kind of five weeks last year, I've been out to touch. Right. You know, the, the uh, 
WTOs, the fight for sanitary committee, and the voting, and all that right. stuff. Right. So you, you, you I do talk about it a lot, and I talk about the European method of the, preca the precautionary principle, which is essentially like, let's make sure something d does no harm or does less harm uh, before we go ahead. Whereas in America, you, as Shelley Pingree said to me, you have to prove that some, you're going to fall down and die with cancer tomorrow um, <laughs> for, uh, before you, know, you ever take something, a, a chemical off the shelf, essentially. Okay, so let's do just, yeah, let's do maybe two more questions. Is that good? wonderful to hear you here. I think Thank more you. people need to hear you, and this dialogue should go on. Are you planning on your book tour to go to any other towns on the Bugel Peninsula? Um, a little trip schedule? <laughs> well, so the, the, the book came out last September, and I already did a book tour. You did it I, this Yeah, I'm pretty much at the tail end of doing that stuff. I mean, of course, if somebody... I just was hoping to bring you over to Castine. Uh, yeah, well, you're certainly welcome to write to me, and if I happen to be in the area, I, uh, I'd be happy to come to the Witherly Library, you're thinking? It, at, yeah, after you wasn't ready, I'd have to the book. Okay, well, read it. You, you, might, you might decide you never want to see me again. So, that's fine. I've been concerned for a long time. You know, mankind has modified, like you just said, plants and other things for a long time. So that's not new. What's new is that modification are happening on an incredible rate, the genetic modification, which goes deeper, uh, because they changed corn for centuries to make it sweeter, and now they're going to make it shorter and more plantable and more resistant, and also introducing things into our body that shouldn't be having that. Mm -hmm. And that's different, it's different now than it was. And I think everybody needs to become aware of that, so that's the only way to say it. And you're doing a good job of doing that. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Yeah. We were going to talk about the wheat be belly, mm. but also oh, the second question is, is it really safe for us to be growing things organically? I mean, yeah. how, um. I mean, the crops are all getting influenced by it, mm. so there's no guarantee that my organic vegetables are going to have so I wrestle with that question, and uh, I, you know, I read some sort of funny and more flip parts of the book. But l when I was researching this book, my heart just literally broke, as the mother of small children and as somebody who's as concerned with all of the voiceless creatures and plants out there as I am. Um, uh, I think the situation is dire, and you're right. There's no, you know, um, our water is contaminated. There's not one river or stream that isn't contaminated with toxins. Um, clouds carry uh, pesticides and toxins in the rain. They fall on our organic crops. That's, this is the hard truth. Um, and uh, many seeds are contaminated. So um, what do you do with that information? I, you, you know, you're asking somebody who lies asleep sometimes when I'm, I still, my husband and I still lie down with our, ch our youngest child is two and a half, but so it makes sense that we're lying down with him, but we still lie down with the oldest one too, and my husband always falls asleep. Um, but I lie there, and I think, what have I done having children in this, at this time? What have I done? What can I tell them? What can I tell them? The news is so dire. As far as I'm concerned, it just breaks my heart. So I don't have anything to say that would make you feel better. I'm sorry. I just think it's you do the best you can and try to, um, you know, there's the poem by Wendell Berry. Um, I, no, the piece of wild things. And I think that you have to enjoy the piece of wild things while you still can, because we don't know how much time we have. Uh -huh. I don't want to end on that the wheat berry piece. Oh, wheat belly. Um, I don't have that much to say about that book, except that I think the most interesting thing about wheat is how it's sprayed with glyphosate to dry it down. And that I think that, um, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to borrow from Shakespeare, I would say the, the, the book, or, you know, look to the pesticides. <laughs> Always look to the pesticides, not to, I think that that's the biggest thing. Bigger than the GMO, really and bigger than, any, bigger than anything else. Them they are inseparable. You're absolutely right. They go hand in hand, and they, it is a, an, an, ingenious, um, an ingenious thing that these companies have come up with, ingenious. They're, the two are hand in hand. 
They, they're making money, and now with Monsanto and Bayer merged, of course, they're going to make the medicines too. It's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing close. Look, these people are brilliant. If only we we could all think this way. That this woman has has had her hand up for a while. I just let me answer her question, then we should stop. Yes. No, but we we eat. Yeah, so I do go into a huge amount of detail, and even there are even recipes in the book. Um, but uh, we we source. I would say about 85 percent of our food is sourced locally. I do have a garden, but I've become finally this summer a slightly better gardener. I'm a little sheepish about this because my parents were back to the landers, and I somehow managed to learn absolutely nothing about gardening <laughs> until this year. But the miracle, my miracle fix, is a rabbit. Rabbit poop. It, she, it's done wonders. But, um, but uh, my, you know, I don't grow everything we eat, but we source our, we get like a, a portion of an organic grass fed cow, we get chickens from someone we know, we get eggs from someone we know, um, and we buy all of our vegetables locally and organically from people we trust. And we, we ask a lot of tough questions. We all, you know, it's intimidating actually to ask farmers these questions. But we ask these questions, um, and when something doesn't quite feel right, we tell them. And that's also weird and uncomfortable. But my kids, the farmers we get our fo food from are household names in our house. We know, they know everywhere our food comes from. So we've modified pretty much, and everything else, uh, most of what we eat, we get make from, from scratch. Right, from those things. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Too.